here with Matt Cullen, who is the policy advisor for flooding for the Association of British Insurers. Matt, thanks very much for agreeing to speak to me today. Thanks. We have heard that the Statement of Principles is expiring in 2013. Firstly, could you explain what the Statement of Principles is and why is it expiring? Yeah. So the Statement of Principles is an agreement that has been in place between the ABI, representing the insurance industry, and the government since the year 2000. Now, it's been renewed on a few occasions since then, 2002, 2005, and 2008. And now we're at the stage after devolution where we actually have four separate agreements, one with England, one with Wales, one with Northern Ireland, and one with Scotland. So what does the Statement of Principles do? Well, it safeguards flood insurance, essentially. Insurers will commit to offer a renewal quote for any home or small business insurance policy which is either not at significant risk or a policy that is at significant risk but where the government or the environment agency have announced plans to reduce that flood risk below significant levels within five years. And this commitment is in exchange for various commitments from the government on managing flood risk. So the Statement of Principles up to this point has been very positive over time. What it's done is it has meant that flood insurance is widely available for the vast majority of properties. But it was only ever intended as a short-term measure. You see, over time, the Statement of Principles distorts the insurance market. And the most obvious way to think of this is by thinking about what would happen if you are a uh, new insurance company coming into the market today. Now, the way that the Statement of Principles is worded means that you, not insuring anybody, obviously don't have to continue insuring anybody. And therefore, you can literally cherry pick whoever you like to insure and reject whoever you like. And that freedom gives new entrants a considerable commercial advantage over incumbents. And it's distortions like this that uh, lead to a situation where over the last 10 years, uh, we don't have a market which is uh, perfectly competitive. And that's why the Statement of Principles cannot be renewed when it expires in 2013. What will happen afterwards? Um, will this mean that flood insurance is still widely available? I can understand why this is a very important issue for the public. Um, obviously, it is vital that uh, we come up with a solution post-2013 where the wide availability and uh, competitive pricing of flood insurance uh, remains. This is why we've been working very closely with the government and with a lot of other stakeholders uh, over the last couple of years really, but it, it's ramped up a lot over the last year. Uh, one of the key bits of progress that we've made with the government is that everyone has now agreed on a set of criteria that we want to fulfil with any new model for flood insurance. And those criteria include things like making sure flood insurance is widely available, making sure that competition between insurers is not distorted, making sure that any solution is practical and deliverable in the long term, and it's been very positive to find out that everybody is now on the same page in terms of what we want to achieve. So where will the conversation end up? That's something I can't really tell you right now because it's a conversation that's still ongoing. But I think what I can say is that there are a number of options. And those options range from very laissez-faire type approaches, basically doing nothing, allowing a free market to take over. So there's investigation of what that means, what's the impact, is that a particularly worryingly bad impact or is that something that's okay? Right up to the other end of the spectrum, which is very interventionist. It's a, uh, a lot of government thinking about how it might maybe subsidise people at the highest risk of flooding or provide support in other ways. Um, so it's a spectrum of different options, um, options that are all being considered, all being looked at. The ABI ourselves have spent a quarter of a million pounds on research uh, just at this single question. So an awful lot of effort is being put into it. Um, and you know, as soon as a, a decision is made and as soon as we know what the future of flood insurance looks like, then, um, then we'll be able to talk about that.
If people are struggling to find affordable and accessible insurance, what advice would you give them? The main piece of advice that we always give to consumers is to shop around the market. We often get complaints from members of the public or from MPs uh, complaining that people can't access insurance. And often, not always, but often, those people have merely gone on a price comparison website and, and come up blank and assumed that that means they can't access insurance. And that's a myth I want to you know, use this conference to help dispel. Often, price comparison websites or uh, online quoting mechanisms on insurance websites are not the most appropriate mechanism to access insurance if you are, um, if you're a special case, I suppose. And I think flood risk does count as, as a, a genuinely special case in insurance, in insurance terms. What we always recommend is one of two things. The first is to use an insurance broker. And that's always a good option because insurance brokers have a good understanding of the insurance market, they have good contacts at insurance companies, and they are able to have human discussions rather than automated, computerized discussions with an insurance company, which is not something you'll get if you go on a price comparison website. So using an insurance broker is great. If you're having particular problems, uh, the British Insurance Brokers Association, or BIBA, run a Find a Broker helpline. And that helpline can be used to help you find access to a broker who specialises in flood risk. Now that can be more useful than a broker who doesn't specialise in flood risk, simply because uh, a specialist flood broker will have an awful lot more expertise in, in these kind of cases and may have experience dealing with cases very similar to the, to the case that you find yourself in. So that's, that's piece of advice number one. Uh, piece of advice number two, if you don't feel like you want to use a broker, is to approach an insurer directly, but do it by telephone. Uh, and if you don't feel like you're getting anywhere, you can always ask to be uh, escalated to a manager or to a, you know, a lead underwriter. And, uh, and see if that gets you any further than you had, had got when you were simply speaking to a call centre. So, so those are our two pieces of, of general advice. Of course, there are other things, aside from the accessing insurance sphere, that you, you can get involved in as well. So, for example, you might want to get involved in the whole area of flood protection. Now, uh, you can ask that question in a second, Mary, but... Um, <laughs> I guess I was, I guess I was going to just differentiate between larger scale flood defences and, and property level flood defences. So the first thing to do is always check if there's any large scale flood defence work going on in your local area. The last thing that we want to encourage is people to protect their homes when uh, there's about to be a large flood defence built down the road. So first of all, check, a, check what's going on, check with the environment agency, check with your local authority to find out what's going on in terms of flood prevention. Now, if there's not that much going on, if you don't feel like your home is going to be protected through that route, then it may be cost effective, it may be beneficial for you to think about investing in property level flood protection. Do you think then that individuals should take responsibility for protecting their own homes? And what can you do as an industry to incentivize that? Uh, I completely agree that um, it is beneficial for uh, a reasonable number of people to take action to protect their properties. Um, it won't be cost effective for everybody, um, but we do have to think about more than cost here. And we have to remember that if you protect your property, you're not only looking at the financial aspects, you're also looking at the huge multitude of intangible benefits that you get from doing that. Um, you won't be out of your home for as long if there's a flood, if at all. Uh, you will probably not lose as many possessions as you may have lost, which you might treasure. So there's an awful lot of stuff which isn't even financial that you can think about. So in that sense, we do firmly encourage people to think about taking action. Now, in terms of incentivizing uh, people to take action, it's maybe slightly trickier than it might first seem apparent for the insurance industry to do that. And that's not to say it doesn't happen, there are a number of good examples where people have made their properties resilient and they have seen an improvement in their insurance terms. Um, but there are also circumstances where they haven't. And we in the insurance industry do understand that that does create uh, problems for people. You know, when they take action and they don't see their, 
insurance premiums for. Uh, what we want to get across is that uh, insurance premiums should reflect the risk of flooding to the property. And if flood risk is truly lower, and that can be quantified, then it makes business sense for an insurer to recognise that or be able to incentivise that. Um, there are some problems to overcome. Um, one of the biggest ones is a kind of, I call it a transaction cost problem. So the, the fact that uh, a human has to come in when you're buying your insurance policy and take a detailed look, that adds a cost. And that may kind of cancel out the benefit that you're getting. So there are kind of problems like that that have to be overcome. And what I would say finally is that we are working again quite closely with the government and with other stakeholders to work out what those barriers are uh, and set out as many actions as we can to try and overcome those barriers as well. If obtaining affordable insurance for at-risk homes could potentially be difficult, will that affect the availability of a mortgage? Uh, yes, I think it might. Mortgage lenders generally expect homes to be fully covered against flood. Um, and when I say fully covered, that means covered for uh, the full price that it costs to uh, reinstate the property or re-repair the damage in a like-for-like -like basis. Um, if, therefore, you haven't got insurance, it is unlikely that you would be able to uh, access or maintain a mortgage. Uh, that is obviously something that we are desperate to avoid. We don't want to see this happen on any kind of large scale at all. And this is why it's so important that we maintain the wide availability of flood insurance in the future. And what advice would you give to somebody that's perhaps considering buying a home that's at flood risk? Yeah. Okay, so I think the first key thing to do here is to try and work out what kind of flood risk we're talking about. So check it out. Go on the Environment Agency website, put the postcode in, check out what the risk seems to be. You can also talk to the local authority, see if they have any information about what the flood risk is. Um, there will also be uh, stuff you can do through the surveys that your solicitor will carry out. So uh, I would recommend getting the solicitor to make sure that they ask the seller, has there been a history of flooding at this property? And if so, what kind of level was it at? How severe was it? Or how deep was it? Maybe even how big was the claim? Check the legal issues. There might be legal issues, for example, maybe if you're moving into a listed building with altering the property in a way that makes the property resilient to flooding or resistant to flooding. So if you have plans to maybe do stuff like that, you need to make sure that that's allowed before you commit to purchasing the property. And then finally, and very importantly, contact your insurance provider or, or a number of potential insurance providers before you sign on the dotted line because it would be uh, terrible to get to a position where you purchased the property and then found that uh, the flood insurance was prohibitively expensive. So I would definitely recommend uh, getting, a, uh, getting a view from insurance companies before you buy. I've been told that people won't sign up for environment agency flood warnings, won't protect their property, uh, won't join a flood group because they fear that if the word gets out, the insurance industry will penalise them for and make their insurance prohibitively expensive or yeah. in worst case scenario, take it away. Um, can you reassure the public that you as an industry are not lurking around corners watching for signs of flood protection on people's properties or looking on village notice boards to see that there's, if there's a flood action group that you're going to go back and go, aha, we can sting this lot? Mm -hmm. uh, well, yes, I, I can confirm that uh, insurers do not lurk on street corners. Um, insurers do use a large variety of uh, different pieces of information when they are considering the price and uh, you know, whether to offer you uh, an insurance quote. Uh, and those bits of data range from environment agency data, environment agency maps, to uh, the insurance company's own modelling and mapping, to information that they've purchased from private companies. So you get, you get private modelling companies who will do flood models and flood maps and so on. So insurers will sometimes purchase those. Uh, they will look at their own claims experience because that correlates pretty well with flood risk. 
So there's this whole melting pot of different things that insurers will look at, uh, but they won't tend to stand around on street corners looking looking for you know whether there's a floodgate on a house or whether there's a uh, you know some some sign of flood warnings or something there. That's um, I think that's getting a little bit too detailed even for the most rigorous of insurers. Uh, what I would say is that because we have this variety of uh, approaches that are used to uh, underwriting, all these different types of data that are used, it's really very important to shop around the market. So we're coming back to a point I made before. No insurer will have exactly the same perspective on any one property because they have all these different data sources that they're using. And this is why it's really important that you don't just go to a single insurer or you don't just uh, go for one option. You have to try and look at a full range of options to make sure you get the best deal for you. And certainly don't worry about joining flood action groups or signing up for environment agency flood warnings. One thing that certainly doesn't happen, and I know some people have asked about, is whether the environment agency pass on information about who signed up for flood warnings to the ABI. Now that certainly doesn't happen. And it certainly wouldn't provide uh, you know, a rigorous enough uh, level of detail, you know, level of information for the insurer to use in a, in a, in a reasonable way. Um, so again, I, I thoroughly encourage people to get involved with that sort of things. And if, if I may carry on a little bit, a little bit more, um, actually I would say that doing action like that um, shows the insurance industry that you are a person who is taking an account of their flood risk, uh, is thinking about it, is trying to do something about it, and I imagine many insurers would see that as a more positive thing than a negative thing. So you as an industry would actively encourage people to sign up for the free Environment Agency flood warning? Yes, absolutely, yes. Great, thank you. Well, thanks very much, Matt, for talking to me today. And I'm sure that a lot of people will be reassured by what you've had to say. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks, Mary. Uh, it's sorry I can't be there in person today. Um, I really hope that this shows you that uh, the insurance industry is doing what it can to make sure that flood insurance remains widely available, even after 2013, when the Statement of Principles expires. And uh, we're not lurking around on street corners. So um, thanks very much.